Race Matters is made possible by support from the Office of Educational Equity at Penn State University. No matter where you live, no matter where you work, no matter who you are, Race matters. You're tuned to WPSU-FM and WPSX-TV. Welcome to the sixth installment of Race Matters. I'm Cindy Deutschman Ruiz. Tonight we'll be talking about kids and race. How do children develop their perceptions about race? And in what ways can parents, educators, and others who work with children affect that process in positive ways? As you start to think about that, I'd like to read something to you. It's from a book called Loving Across the Color Line. It's written by a white mother, a woman by the name of Sharon Rush, who talks about raising her biracial child. And this is from a conversation the two had when Rush's daughter was nine. They were sitting in bed, and her daughter said, Mom, explain something to me. There are so many black things in the world. Some people have black hair. There are black shoes, black cars. Even the nighttime is black. So tell me, how come with so many black things to hate white people pick something with feelings. I don't get it. We will be taking your calls, and if you want to uh, react to that or talk at all about um, your own experiences of race as a child and what you see as being different from then and today, please give us a call. The number is 800-543-8242. That's 800-543-8242. For anybody who wants to hear or view this broadcast via the Internet, you can log on to racematters.psu.edu. We are streaming live from the show's section of the website. Again, that's racematters.psu.edu. And now now let me welcome my guests. Joining me in the studio tonight is Terrell Jones, Vice Pro Provost for Educational Equity at Penn State. His office financially supports this program. Hi, Terrell. Hi, how are you? Good, how are you? I'm very well, thank you. Lawrence Hirschfeld joins us by phone. He's an Associate Professor of Anthropology and Psychology at the University of Michigan and author of Race in the Making, Cognition, Culture, and the Child's Construction of Human Kinds. Hi, Larry. Hi. Thanks for being here. Thanks for asking. Um, I'd like to start with you and, and ask you what it is that we, as adults, should know about how very young children, I'm talking about toddlers, preschoolers now, how they understand or perceive um, race already at that, uh, at that point in their uh, development. I, I think that what we uh, need to bear in mind and what uh, is often difficult for us to admit, and partly because it's not as obvious as it might uh, otherwise seem, is that children are very sensitive to race. Even very, very young children are sensitive to race. And uh, sadly, even three-year-olds uh, show the kinds of uh, prejudice that uh, is endemic to the rest of the society. Can you talk about how they show it at the age of three? Well, that, that's part of the problem, I suppose, is that they, they, it's, it's fairly easy to uh, see in um, the contrived uh, environments of a laboratory where you uh, present kids with a scenario that they would otherwise not uh, have much, uh, uh, that wouldn't happen in, in everyday life. Mm -hmm. And uh, they'll identify uh, positive characteristics with the majority children and uh, negative characteristics with uh, minority kids. Mm -hmm. uh, the reason that we don't seem to see it in uh, everyday life, or at least everyday life in America, is that children uh, learn their prejudices before they learn how to identify who are the targets of prejudice. So they know that they don't like people of certain categories for which they may know the name, but Can they... I'm sorry. Oh, I was just going to say, can you explain that a little bit? They learn prejudice before they knew they know who to be prejudiced against exactly? Is that what you said? Yeah. The, how does that work? Well, it, actually, a lot of uh, conceptual development works that way. It is, huh. uh, children uh, begin to understand what a general concept means and only later begin to map on specific instances. Mm -hmm. a, a classic uh, case about which there's a lot of study, it, it deals with color, but not the uh, color in the racial sense, is you can try to teach a child color terms, a young child color terms, and they just 
won't seem to understand it, even though they use color to organize uh, things in the world. They're very sensitive to color, but they can't seem to learn the words. I'm talking about you know, toddlers they can't, now. They can't learn the word. They don't seem that to learn the blue word. And then, goes with, with the color blue, you're saying? Yeah. But they recognize right. it. Right. I but see. But then one day, literally, they'll catch that colors mean refer to the chromatic properties of the world. They're not very good at matching which color word goes with which color, mm-hmm. but they suddenly realize that color words are uh, uh, are connected to the are color connected concept. to the color of, of, of things in the world. Yeah. and then they start learning which words go with which color. I see. Now, um, this is the, the the idea here is that they learn some umbrella concept before they learn the specific instances. Okay. The same thing seems to be true of uh, the way they learn about the social world. Uh, or at least parts of the social world. And uh, this is particularly true of race, where despite the fact that adults tend to think of race as something that you open up your eyes and see, mm-hmm. uh, at least in, for the developing child, it's something that they open up their ears and listen to the way people talk about the world, develop the categories, pick up on the prejudices, and, and then uh, later start only to later put those pieces start together. To, uh, Associated, so it's only right. later that that you can see it in their in their everyday behavior. Okay. Now, Terrell, I noticed that you were nodding um, when Larry first mentioned this idea of children learning about prejudice um, mm-hmm. before mm-hmm. they understand necessarily who to be prejudiced against. Was there something you wanted to add to that? Well, I think it's particularly interesting. My my research really isn't as uh, doesn't work with children as young as as I think uh, Larry is talking about. But it's real clear to me that. You know, from what I've read and see that children, you know, prejudice is not so much taught as it is caught. Mm. It's your interactions with the larger society, the people who are around you who create that world and create meaning for you. Mm -hmm. And there are some, you know, very, very clear uh, indicators of where those sources are. I was uh, thinking about Robert Milner's book, I think it's called Children and Race. Mm -hmm. And he says that you have basically five areas that you can, that either amplify the prejudice for you Mm -hmm. or, you know, kind of uh, lessen its impact. In the first place you pick up your prejudice, this is not rocket science, first place you pick it up would be from, uh, or have it lessened would be your parents. Mm -hmm. Okay, and you know, because they construct a great deal of the world for you when you're a young Sure. child like Larry's mentioning and, and and make meaning of it. There are some concepts, for example, that, you know, I'm always amazed even with my two, three children that we were able to sell some of those concepts, you know, <laughs> Santa, Santa Claus. You know, if you sell uh-huh. Santa Claus, if you can sell an Easter bunny, and I'm never sure, you know, we, we, we sell an Easter bunny who has eggs, and I've never made it, you know, the connection, but they buy that. Mm-hmm. Uh, you sell a tooth fairy. Mm-hmm. Okay. If you can sell concepts like that, then the concepts of color or the concept that somebody's better than somebody else because of their gender mm-hmm. become pretty easy sure. and understandable. Mm-hmm. Well, I want to get back to uh, a little later in the program. I want to talk a little bit more about the various ways that, that we can be promoting or projecting different ideas. But before we get to that, we've actually gotten a couple of calls already. So I'd like to go to Loretta in State College. Loretta. Hi. Hi, welcome to the program. Um, I'm feeling kind of discouraged that you think, or our speakers think, um, everybody ends up being like their parents, because um, (laughs) my mother was born in 1900 in Richmond, Virginia, and grew up with all the prejudice of that era and that place. And uh, yet, I didn't find that was okay. Right. In 1964... When they passed the uh, Civil Rights Act, I said to her <clears throat> that, you know, I was really happy, and she said, well, I know it has to happen, but doesn't it kill you? Mm-hmm. <laughs> right. So in a way, I mean, she understood that everybody should have equal rights and equal treatment, mm-hmm. but she didn't totally accept it. Now, we had five kids, and we've raised them in state college, and when my youngest child was in fourth grade, I think it was, she said, um, can Kim come over and study with me? And I said, sure. And Kim walked in, and uh, she was a biracial child. Mm -hmm. And Charlotte never mentioned that. just didn't occur to her. I taught school in State College for 10 years, and 
some of the most popular kids in my classes were not uh, Anglo-Saxon whites. Right. And I'm sure there were kids that had prejudice at home, but they didn't seem to transfer that to their classmates. So. Right. Well, I think you raise a number of different issues, and, and, and one of them, for example, is the issue of children and, and whether they name race and what that means about their perceptions of it. And I know that, that Larry has some ideas about that because we were just talking about it the other day. Can you speak to that a little bit, Larry? Uh, well, yeah, there, you, the caller brought up a number of points that are uh, uh, really important uh, and really interesting. And I was mulling them over, so why don't you repeat to me <laughs> oh, exactly sorry. which one you wanted me to speak <laughs> I'm sorry about that, Larry. No, I, have, I wanted I to... I wanted, writing it while you... Uh, <laughs> I, I wanted to try to keep us, um, at this part of the show, more toward the younger end of the age mm-hmm. spectrum with children. Sure, and okay. because we had talked about, uh, in an earlier conversation, talked about the question of whether how much kids talk about race versus what they perceive about race. Okay. Um, and it had been my perception prior to talking to you that, that the fact that my son was and talking about it probably meant that there wasn't an issue there. Yeah. And that's a very logical thing to believe, but I, I understand that, that that is not what you believe, and I wanted you to explain why. Right. Well, there are, there are a variety of reasons that um, parents uh, have an image of their children which may differ uh, from uh, uh, their children's actual thinking about things. One is, of course, we don't want them to be uh, influenced uh, by things that we feel are wrong. Right. Two, because of that, and because I think we don't want to hear that this might be the case, parents actually talk very, very little about race to, to, to their children. It's particularly true of majority majority parents. So if you, um, Phyllis Katz, a developmental psychologist yeah. in Colorado, uh, has done one of the few studies on this, and they find that you know parents just don't talk to children, young children. Mm-hmm. about race. Mm-hmm. But um, I think that um, what is, what's really going on with the young child is that they're trying to sort out what are the relevant dimensions of the world. And that information in many ways is, is more directly um, evident. It's easier to read by listening to the way people talk, mm-hmm. even if people don't talk to you about about uh, race, you do begin to hear sort of what the society believes about race. And that, that was one of the things that the uh, caller brought up, and it was very important. Of course, we're not copies of our parents. Social right. life is not like uh, biological life in that there are, you know, replication. It, it's, we're, we're pretty, uh, we're sort of copies of our parents, but not perfect <laughs> it, by any means. And Quasi the, copies? Right, for the better or the worse. Right. And certainly there are historical changes. There are major historical changes, and the caller uh, made reference to one of them. One of the things, unfortunately, that, that this sometimes masks is that the historical changes are in the way we um, talk about some aspects of the world rather than the world itself. So it's become extremely impolite to uh, voice some of the things that the caller's mother would easily, readily voice. That doesn't mean necessarily, and it uh, almost certainly doesn't mean in reality, that the uh, the levels of prejudice are all that different. Mm -hmm. Um, We just know what we're supposed to say. We know, and and I I don't mean that we're insincere, but we truly want that to be the case. But nonetheless, uh, a, a lot of the social environment is continues to be uh, uh, saturated with uh, practices and beliefs that disadvantage minority people. Right. And I think it's a good idea to, to stay on, on this topic for just a minute about the issue of what we learn from our parents and how much of it is something that we put into our, our day-to-day practice. Because what I noticed or what I sensed from Loretta was, was this sense of... Um, well, that means I'm doomed, right? If I if I'm going to be like my parents, then then I somehow. To say was I think kids get to an age where they can uh, understand moral differences. You sure. Know, begin to make rational decisions, and of course that's not when they're preschoolers. Right, they right. Do reach an age where they start looking at the world and deciding for themselves. 
Sure. And and I know that we all know that just from our own personal experiences, that that's what that's something that we did. But I also I, I also wanted Terrell to address this this issue of to what extent and in what ways we um, we absorb that which um, our parents either teach us by example, yeah. um, by word, by deed, whatever. Before you say that, though, 800-543-8242 is the number. Again, 800-543-8242. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Loretta, there's a wonderful saying, and I think it's speech communication area where they talk about, I think the saying goes, you cannot not communicate, meaning that everything we do communicates. So like Larry mentioned, what we choose to talk about and what we choose not to talk about also communicates volumes to our children. Now, I think Loretta is, is making some excellent points. I don't think that, Loretta, I, I don't think that we're carbon copies and we're stamped out and we can't make conscious choices to change what we believe and and, and do different things depending upon the kind of environment we are. But I I, I work primarily with uh, uh, college students already and I, w- I wish I had a nickel for every college student who said to me, I'm not prejudiced, but my parents are. And I think it's a great statement, but you, know, you have to Think that through. Did you grow up in a terrarium or did you grow up with your parents? What they're actually saying is, I reject many of the things that I learned from my parents and from maybe my community, and I'd like to think of myself differently. But you have to have some ownership for the fact that you learned some of those things in order to unlearn them. Right. 800-543-8242. Larry, did you want to add something to that? Yeah, I... I, I... Precisely what Threat was saying about um, how we think about and uh, evaluate what kinds of things we want to uh, keep from what we learn, that's uh, actually one of the major tasks of, of college life. For mm-hmm. Right. And children, particularly young children, do a similar version, but it's not quite as... Uh, um, conscious or as uh, organized. And many things young children learn about, they learn to pay attention to different kinds of evidence in different ways. So for instance, if your parents were non-native speakers, say of English, Mm -hmm. and spoke with a strong accent, if we just listened to our parents, you would anticipate that young language learning children would develop the foreign sounding accents of their parents. Right, and they don't. They don't. Right. They do it because they seem to pay attention to less frequent information that is from the wider community and discount more frequent local information. Now, that's particularly dramatic when you're looking at the action of non native speakers, but it's also evident when you look at the uh, the need to have people speak in ways that are mutually uh, relevant and, and mutually understandable. And so a good thing to do would be to uh, develop the speech habits of your community rather than necessarily a very local area of the community. Okay. Can you explain exactly what you mean about the speech? Did you say speech patterns? Yeah. I mean, I'm talking now just uh, simply about the sounds of speech. I see. And um, so, so in relation, though, to the discussion of race, you seem right. to be saying that the that the overall community and the and the society and the context in which children live um, is possibly more important in certain respects than their parents. Precisely, for whatever reason, beliefs and attitudes about race seem to be one of the areas of life for which parental uh, modeling is less important than community modeling. So, sorry, go ahead. Yeah, and in fact, there are a number of studies that have uh, shown that parents and young children's attitudes are not strongly associated at all. And this is true even for parents who uh, make very concerted efforts at um, organizing and channeling their children's racial beliefs. Um, so what you're saying is it's it, you can be very intentional as a parent and there still needs to be more happening outside of, of your home in order for those for that those lessons to really be taken on by the child. 
if yes. Uh, I, I don't want to sound too much like doom and gloom, and, and, and that was, you know, Loretta, Loretta uh, rightly, you know, sort of said, "Gee, this sounds depressing." Right. I don't mean that parents can't do anything, but it, right. w- it's it's um, naive to imagine that, you know, we can, as a single family, sort of swim upstream against an enormous rush of information. Okay. Uh, that's going the other way. Okay. Now, Go ahead. I'm sorry. Oh no! I was now. People can develop uh, and do develop all sorts of checks on their instincts, if you will. These are not really instincts in the sense that you're born with them. But let's say you develop very strong attitudes mm-hmm. about something. Well, you can learn to check those and act in ways that are inconsistent with those. If, first, if you see that 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 won't be acceptable in in well, the wider there, community, for example, right? There, I mean, there are lots of there are lots of things uh, that are like that and that have sort of political and moral qualities. There are lots of them that have much simpler uh, uh, sides. The first time I ate oysters, I didn't like them. The second time I ate oysters, I didn't like them. The third time I ate oysters, I didn't like them. But eventually, I learned to like oysters because I was sort of committed to learning to like. I was going to say, I don't know why you would keep trying to like oysters. <laughs> well, That's an interesting. Do. Well, but think, yeah. think, think about it. Think about another <laughs> an, uh, another alternative. People um, uh, want to lose weight, and yeah. uh, one way would be for someone who's important to them to tell them that they're not hungry, and then they would magically lose weight. Uh-huh. Another way would be for them to tell themselves that they don't want to gain weight, and even though they feel like eating, they're going to do something to try to control their diet. Mm-hmm. Now, one of those seems to be a reasonable way to lose weight, and one of them seems to be a, a fairly implausible way to lose weight. I like the idea of somebody being able to tell you, though, yeah, and that working. Yeah, it would be nice, but it doesn't work. But unfortunately, that's the way we approach racial attitudes with children. And then we're, what we're really talking about, then, is a certain form of mind control. Which is maybe not. I mean, if you if you could actually look at someone and say you lose weight now, and then the person did, it actually has some frightening components to it. We have uh, we have a caller who's ne- been, ne- never worked for me. I never worked for ne- you. Never worked. <laughs> we have a caller who's been waiting for a while. Deb from Lewistown. Hi. Hi. Uh, my comment may not be quite as erudite as your two uh, guests. Well, I wouldn't worry about that. Yeah, I wouldn't either. <laughs> I would hope so. Uh, um, my daughter and son-in-law have two children. They're five and three, and they started homeschooling them at two and four. And they got a children's book about Dr. Martin Luther King. Mm-hmm. And my grandson just had a fit. He could not see why that man should be shot, why he should be treated the way he, I mean, he got angry. Yeah. Four years old. His mother did not say, now get angry over this. She just read the book. Right. And, but the way that they have been raised was that everybody's equal and, you know, this color, gender, um, sexual orientation it there's mm-hmm. nothing different you know right right everybody is good unless they hurt somebody or do something bad so dr king hadn't done anything bad so why could he be treated this way and the child was just of course the two-year-old had no idea mm-hmm. what was going on and we got our little house in the prairie books but <laughs> you know, at four years old his he was able to on his own, decide that this was wrong. Right, right. Mm-hmm. So it's your feeling that that what your um, what your daughter is, how your daughter is teaching the grandchildren, is actually being very effective as far as raising them in a way to understand the the fundamental unfairness of racism. Yes, both my daughter and my son-in-law, mm-hmm. because they show, they live it. Okay. You know, I mean, children, how else do they, they live it? Learn what they live. But Deb, how else do they live it besides this book about Martin Luther King? Are there that's how they treat people? Uh huh. They have black friends, and if they see, excuse me, African American, I'm never sure what term to use. Mm-hmm. But if you know, they would never uh, make a joke, a racial joke, or a remark about someone of a different race. It's just they're brought up to believe everybody's equal. Mm-hmm. You know. Okay. And there are bad people, but, 
you know, it's it's not any one group. Okay. Larry wanting to say something. Uh, I'm sorry, I should... Uh, no, no, I go ahead, please. All our, uh, the, the things that prepared is in thoughtful treatments. Mm-hmm. Fairness is extreme, extremely fair. They, they love to hurl it at you, too. They, That's well, they not love fair. to hurl it at you. I mean, it's one of the, actually, it's one of the few things that they can hurl at you, given yes. the differences in power. Right. But it's, it's truly one that they think about. That's not fair. You can't do that. That's not fair. Right. But the other thing is that they distinguish between things that aren't fair because there are rules that say you can't do that. Mm-hmm. Uh, say, like, talk in class. And things that aren't fair because, it, and again, your, your caller uh, picked exactly the right word, harmed other people. Right. A and moral ch- kind of fairness. Right. And children are very sensitive to uh, harm and the fact that anything that does harm to someone is really bad. Okay. And if they can be convinced, say, that racism harms people Mm -hmm. that is one way that we can get at their attitudes and hope to change them so so in essence what you're talking about is is working with that already sort of inborn or at least very early um, uh, concept of fairness uh, that working with that in terms of race is actually very effective right Mm -hmm. okay Uh, did you want to add something to that Terrell well you know, I think it's an interesting you know, concept, and, and, I, and I like what Larry has to say and, and our last caller. But you know, I, I also think that you know, our, our children are influenced by a multitude of uh, events and people. And uh, you have to also understand, for example, that I think our, our caller mentioned that they were homeschooling yes. the two children. But if they watch television, then there will be stereotypes that they have to interact with that with a stereotype about if we learn in school. And don't forget that when we talk about we learn, mm-hmm. you know, if you discovered America, realize he did discover, you know, maybe 10 million for 10,000 part of the discussion. Right. And if that's the kind of, you know, education that many of us have received, then we also have to learn to reject that stuff. If mm-hmm. we're going to make some changes, if not, we're going to make a lot of mistakes in dealing with people who come from those other cultures. Absolutely. Um, 800-543-8242. We have more people on the line. Let's go to Michael in Beach Creek. Michael? Yes. Um, Hi. I have some bad news. You do? Yes. Okay. Um, raised a Catholic, worked in several different countries on three different continents, uh, invited three uh, Cubans and black Americans to live in my home. I consider myself a little more open-minded than the people that I've seen in central Pennsylvania. You're not a native? The N-word has been used in more than one location and over a number of years. In central PA you're talking about? Central Pennsylvania, yes. Okay. And I just thought I'd let you know that in places where there are very few African Americans, uh, we just have the stereotypes. Right. I've seen it. Uh, I abhor it, but right. I thought I'd let you know it still exists. I don't think you're surprising any of us, but I appreciate the uh, I appreciate the input. And actually, it's kind of interesting too because Terrell brought a book in that talks. Do you have? Um, what do you think about about what uh, what Michael is talking about about his travels and coming coming to Central Pennsylvania? I, I think that you know there's a one there's another book the, the, the particular book that we, you're talking about is by is by Randall Kennedy and it's called it's called the strange character of a troublesome word and and focuses on the N word. Uh, but I think what happens is I think all of us are kind of two people sometimes. The person that we want to be and the person we are out in public, but then uh, there's a different person sometimes when we're talking privately or socially. Mm -hmm. You know, Van Dyck in in his book uh, uh, called Communicating Racism says that you have to understand that when most of that stuff is communicated, it's not through formal systems, it's around the dinner table, Mm -hmm. it's around the card table, it's with people that we know and we feel comfortable with 
and people who know that if there were people like that around, we really wouldn't say it. Mm-hmm. Okay, and it's something that we just have to learn to address. That you know, uh, those people don't have to be around for you not to learn to not say those things or to realize that they're wrong and they're hurtful. Mm-hmm. And the interesting part of that is, then you really don't want those other people around because. And they really affect your communication pattern and your right. social interaction because, you know, sooner or later somebody's going to make a mistake and say the wrong thing. Mm-hmm. And they're going to say that wonderful thing that they always say, and that is, you know, I really didn't mean it. Mm-hmm. Okay, I, 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 You know, this was a mistake. This is really not me. Mm-hmm. And I think sometimes you'll find that, uh, depending upon the person, they, they will have some trouble uh, buying that rationale. Mm-hmm. Okay, because that's, I think many people are aware that those things happen all the time. Mm-hmm. Larry, anything you wanted to mention about that? Well, the, the, yeah, there are a couple of things. Uh, one is the the book that uh, Terrell just mentioned, Communicating Racism, is, is really a wonderful book. Uh, Van Dyke is a, is a Dutch yeah. linguist and has been working on race for a long time. And one of the other points that he makes in the book is that anti-racist talk unfortunately is made up mostly of racist claims so it's like don't believe and then a fairly long and complicated thing don't believe that x population has these negative traits say i see and from cognitive theory we know that we're more likely to pick up the the claim the stuff that happens after the don't not you know before it right you we're mo- most likely to remember all the stuff that happens after the don't. Yes, is what mm-hmm. you're saying. Yeah. Uh huh. Just because the the information is weighted that way. Okay. And, uh, and, and another, I mean, it, it, it's always nice to talk about somebody else's behavior, but I <laughs> can probably make this point by talking about one of the more humiliating experiences in my life. I was at a friend's wedding, and uh, the uh, the bridegroom was. Uh, was black, and so there were it was a, a mixed uh, group of people. And I uh, walked up to the bar, and there was a, a person serving drinks uh, in, in a you know a nice shirt and standing behind the bar and serving. And I asked him for a drink, and and he said, "I'm the I'm the groom's brother." <laughs> and he wasn't serving drinks at all. He was just standing behind the bar. He didn't happen to be wearing a suit. Mm-hmm. And that, I could say, well, that was why I did it. But the fact of the matter is that I had expectations about what people do in the world. Right. And this was an expectation I had, and it's not a very pretty one, and it's one, you know, I mean, here it is. I, I try to make my life understanding, you know, I, my career is understanding these kinds of things and with the hope of making maybe changing stuff, and I, I can't even get my own head. Sure. You know, to to work uh, consistently and in and, and exactly the way that Terrell was talking about. You, you just kind of let down just a little. Right. And uh, things that you just don't want to see, you see. Yeah. It, that maybe has something to do with what you said earlier, Ter- Terrell, um, about uh, about who we want to be versus who yeah. we are and the, and the differences that, that can yeah. exist. I think Larry makes an excellent point, for, you know, and, and I, I think all of us, I, I really don't want to come across as someone who's saying you do this Mm -hmm. and not understanding that I do this on a regular basis too. Mm -hmm. And I think that's really where we need to get to if we're to make some progress in this area, not to just suggest that this is a problem that one group has. Mm -hmm. This is not a we, they, this is an us thing. And we ought to realize that. I think, you know, I'm, I'm always amazed. For example, when I talk sometimes, I go, what do I know about Mexican American heritage and culture. I've been raised primarily in the middle of Pennsylvania, in Harrisburg, and not much if you don't take into account that I've watched every episode of Zorro ever done, every episode of the Cisco Kid I watch religiously. Mm -hmm. So that means I catch that culture just like anybody else, and I have to check myself so I don't end up saying some of the stereotypic things Mm -hmm. about Mexican-Americans. was very comfortable with. I mean, that, I mean, the show didn't end without a comic relief, and mm-hmm. you know, it was always you know someone mispronouncing something, and right. of course, I picked that up. I love cowboy and western movies when I was growing up. How the West was won. Well, there are very few 
uh, cowboy and western movies taught from a Native American or, or, or that have a Native American perspective. There are some newer ones that have that. But my goodness, I couldn't understand why these people were so bad out in the West. Mm-hmm. And why all these people wanted to do was to settle on a little land. Right. And, you know, and how could they just and do what they did? And here were the people trying to, other people trying to kill them. Oh, right? my yeah. goodness. And, you know, and this thing about, you know, the whole idea of the scalping. And I, I thought, oh, this is so bad. And I realized it wasn't even the Native Americans who started that. That was actually something that uh, Europeans who came to the United States started to invent as a concept. And and we start thinking about it from that perspective. I think that there's all of us have to realize there's a great deal that we, many of us have been miseducated. Mm -hmm. And we have to like, if we're going to work with kids, you know, we got to give them a spectrum, if you will, of ways of perceiving any event Mm -hmm. you know yes columbus was a great uh explorer but you know there were other people there were other interpretations for example of america and what it means to be an american Mm -hmm. and yeah when i talk with for example most uh white students who are in college i go where does your awareness of african americans begin and after some discussion they will say well it begins with slavery Mm-hmm. Begins with the Civil War, mm-hmm. you know. Go. Well, what, what, do, what do you think these people were doing before the Civil War? And they go. I really don't have any no. idea. Right. You know. Then you wonder why, for example, I don't want this person as a roommate because they don't have a culture the way other people have a culture or a history. It's just a history of victimhood. Just, exactly. Right. Right. Um, if you've just joined us, you're tuned to Race Matters on WPSU FM and WPSX TV. We are talking about kids and race. That was Terrell Jones. You just heard in the studio. He's vice provost for educational equity at Penn State. And on the phone, we have Lawrence Hirschfeld, University of Michigan professor of psychology and anthropology, and author of a book called Race in the Making. Our number again: eight hundred five four three eight two four two. We've got a few people on the phone. Uh, and I hope I don't mispronounce your name. Is it Nakia in Olean? Yes. Hi. Welcome to the show. Thank you. i um, been sitting here for a while, and a number of things have um, come in and out of my head. Um, the first thing I wanted to address was um, that um, I agree with um, Terrell with, when he said that this is an us problem. Um, a lot of people think of race as just being black and white, um, and that's not the case. There's also the issue of race or maybe a cultural misunderstanding within mm-hmm. all race and ethnicities. Um, I, um, I graduated from a predominantly white university, and um, I'm African American, and I caught on to a lot of um, the different um, misunderstandings that could, could happen within various cultures. Mm-hmm. Um, can you give I an example? That when students, um, when children, um, they do come from an environment around their parents and their community, mm-hmm. and then going on to, you know, junior high school and high school, the different transitions that they make, it, it becomes more and more difficult. Um, I think in order to have a well-rounded um, person, um, they're taught different um, values um, from their parents. Then when they move into high school or junior junior high school to high school. They learn different things, and then going on to college where they're separated sort of from their parents and the community that they grew up in, Mm -hmm. um, they sort of learn new things. Um, So are you feeling then that there are so many... Being an African-American woman going to a predominantly white university, I learned that, you know, white people um, sort of, there's there's different ethnicities and cultural... um, things that I had to understand. Um, an Italian American is not the same as an Irish American. They have different backgrounds. Right. So I can't view them as being the same, with the same as going on to a German American. Um, they all have different backgrounds. Um, just the same as one black person um, can have a different cultural background than another. They can be a Caribbean American um, um, or an African native. Um, so there's different things that you have to take into consideration. And I think that um, I don't know if the problem of, you know, race and discrimination can, you know, be solved in, you know, in my lifetime, but there are things um, as sort of trying to understand and to empathize with different cultures. I think it's more of a cultural thing than to deal with race, dealing with, you know, black and white. Mm-hmm. Um, I have Latino friends who one may be um, a Dominican American and one is, you know, a Puerto Rican American and 
I sort of thought they were, I thought everyone was Puerto Rican. <laughs> and I would get um, <clears throat> um, few choice words said to me when I called one of my Dominican friends and um, approached her as being Puerto Rican, and she was just really offended. Right, right. Um, and they explained to me that, you know, the different, how they prepare food differently, how they dare right. differently and things like that. So I, there were things that I had to um, understand that were, that were new to me. You know, um, I, it seems to me you're, you're, you're saying two things that actually work very well together, but in some sense may seem to be mutually exclusive. And one is that we're all individuals. So whether we're black or white or Latino or anything else, we are individual people and need right. to be treated as such. Exactly. But you're also saying that there are very distinct group identities, and there is a difference between somebody who's grown up in a Puerto Rican setting versus a Dominican setting, and a different sense of identity. So you not only have to be sensitive to this group identity, but also sensitive to the idea of a person being who he or she is as an individual, right? Um, which is a very challenging thing. I actually, that it brings me to something that I had wanted to read tonight anyway. Um, this is from a book called The Freedom Writer's Diary, Writers as in People Who Write. Um, and this is actually a group of young people from Southern California who were keeping diaries as, as, uh, as part of a school project. It says, when I was born, the doctor must have stamped national spokesperson for the plight of black people on my forehead, a stamp visible only to my teachers. The majority of my teachers treat me as if I and I alone hold the answers to the mysterious creatures that African-Americans are, like I'm the Rosetta Stone of black people. Now, I wanted to read that because it's very... Um, it really says quite beautifully something that I hear all the time from students, for example, at Penn State, black students who wind up being the only black student in many of their classes. Mm -hmm. And I think it's something that, that you're also talking about, too, this sense of I'm supposed to be able to speak mm -hmm. for an entire huge, very multifaceted um, group of people, and that's not fair, that's not right, that lumps me unfairly right. into a group. We find that at um, my university, too, I currently work there now, uh -huh. um, <laughs> trying to um, build up um, multicultural um, recruitment and things. And as an undergrad at this university, I too, when I would sit in history class and we talked about slavery, all heads would turn to me. Um, <laughs> I, I, and I'm looking like, okay, I don't know. You know, I'm here to learn just like everyone else is right. here to learn. There were some things that, yeah, I could contribute to, um, it's an uncomfortable feeling, too, it's isn't it? It's very uncomfortable, um, and you get it from both students and you get it from you get it from professors as well. And that's something that she mentions here in this book, and I think is really important for us to talk about. This this has to do with the people who are teaching us as young children, as older children, and as young adults in college. That there is this this situation that's being played out in classroom after classroom after classroom. And I think what one of the things it does is make people feel isolated, mm -hmm. right? You already know you're the only black person in the class. That's pretty obvious. Right. But if somebody does that, then that makes you feel, again, even further removed, doesn't it? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So how do we, when we're, you know, what's the answer to that? When you're in a classroom um, and you have a situation like that, um, how would you have wanted the teacher to react? Would you have wanted the teacher to just um, treat everybody in the class as exactly the same and just to, just try to start a conversation going that would involve everyone? Yeah. Mm -hmm. I, I, I've been in that situation I, I countless times. And um, if, I, I, if I don't have any, anything to contribute, um, I, I do, like, sort of set up sort of like a dialogue um, with everyone Mm -hmm. else in the in, in the class um and as as well it can happen with our native american students you know in the class like i said it's an individual thing and right. it is unfortunate that professors look for um or may single out a student um a student of color if they are dealing with um an issue surrounding them but i think that they a, a professor should teach right um, that's what they're there to do they should already have um that that background in order to teach um, the subject that they're teaching. Something that we're doing is we're putting all of our professors through sort of like a diversity workshop mm -hmm. um, so they know what to say and, and, and know what not to say, um, involving faculty, staff, and students um, in this dialogue so they know how a student may feel um, when they're singled out right? Um, and things like that. Not when um, there's been incidents where we have a, a student on campus who may want to go on a tour um, of the university and they'll try to find maybe an African-American student 
if it's an African American student to give that tour. Mm -hmm. um, and um, it's it's and students um, come up to me as an undergrad and now as a staff person and say, you know, I don't want to be the poster child for. <laughs> <laughs> you know, so this effort to actually make the person more comfortable again is, is this kind of sense of being singled out, right? Is, exactly, right. Well, I, I appreciate you bringing up those points, Nikki, and I think it's a it's a good way for us to segue into what are some of the ways that we can, um, whether we're educators, whether we're parents, or just people in the community, what are some of the ways um, that we can begin to change our own behaviors and our own approaches to race or to history or whatever it might be in order to begin to, to break some of these things down. Now, one of the things that um, Larry mentioned earlier was how little people tend to trace or parents talk about race. And I wanted to have Ter Terrell talk a little bit about that, too, because in your um, Ph.D. work, what you had found was uh, you were looking at the effect of reading Huckleberry Finn mm -hmm. um, on ninth graders. Mm -hmm. And what you found was that... Um, in many cases, this was the first time yeah. that these students had ever been led in some kind of a discussion of race. That's right. So what does it mean in terms of, I mean, I guess it means we all need to talk about it more. But it's more than that, isn't it? I mean, there are certain ways that we need to try to, to deal with these issues, do you think? Yeah, I, I think what we have to do is to become comfortable with the discussion. You know, uh, I remember this wonderful interaction once where someone sent me to the airport, the State College Airport, to pick up a visiting professor. His name was Professor Johnson, and if you know anything about State College Airport, it's not all that busy. There's only generally one plane coming in at a time. But I remember this experience because Professor Johnson was Asian, and no one told me he was Asian. There were 40 people on the plane. And you wouldn't think from a name like Johnson, Johnson that you'd be looking yeah, for it. Well, probably not. Yeah. So there was only one man who was on the plane who was Asian. He got off the plane. I said hello. I kept looking out the window. Uh, I, had, <laughs> I had him paged, you know, and he was still standing. <laughs> so, you know, then I had that terrible, you know, moment where you went, oh, I didn't see you. Of course I saw him. I just didn't realize that was him. And I remember I got back to the office and said, how come you didn't tell me Professor Johnson was Asian? He said, I didn't think it was that important. Now, that he's Asian isn't of itself that important. But if you want me to pick him up, right. it's pretty important that, that you tell me what he looks like. Now, if you get stuck in this, like, you know, you can't see differences. I'm colorblind. Right. Everybody's the same. I treat everybody the way I wish to be treated. Then you miss a great deal. Race is not an important variable in every interaction. At least that's what I believe. But in some interaction, it is paramount to understand that race is a very important variable to understand what's happening. Yeah. And what happens is we've told kind of ourselves and everybody else, the best thing to do is not see it, mm -hmm. to be colorblind. Because that means you're not a racist right. if you're colorblind. And you know, the people who are colorblind have no, no trouble stopping when the light is red and no trouble going when the light is green. So they're really not colorblind, what they are is in a kind of denial, mm -hmm. you know, and that's really part of our problem. And that, I think, um, comes a, somewhat from this inability or unwillingness to talk yeah. about it from a very young age. And, Larry, I wanted you to, to address this because y you do work more on this, on this younger age. Um, how, you know, I have this five-year-old who I tried to talk to about the portrayal of Indians in the movie Peter Pan, which I had completely forgotten about, but when I saw him watch it, I was appalled. And let me just say that the conversation was a complete disaster, and he basically told me if I didn't like the movie, maybe I shouldn't watch <laughs> it. So how do we with young children to begin to talk to them about race in ways that, that raise the comfort level, in ways that, that get them ready to deal with some of these issues later on in life? I, part of it, I think, is to, again, to get back to the, um, their sensitivity to moral versus conventional rules mm -hmm. is to try to get them to see the structure of relations and the, the harm that this causes, and particularly the harm that it causes to groups of people rather than individuals. Mm -hmm. One of the things that we tend to do when we talk about race with kids is that we do it in a way that highlights the conventional. So we highlight we celebrate when we're trying to 
bring kids' attention to it in a way that's comfortable to talk about it. Mm -hmm. We celebrate cultural differences. We talk about Cinco de Mayo. We talk about Black History Month. Uh, we, we, we talk a lot about how these are wonderful differences between people that, w that we should all know about. Right. Well, talking about them that way talks about them as conventions, as part of the rules of the way the world is, is, is organized. They're not about how power is organized in the world. And, and if, if, if there was just difference, if people were just different, and that didn't translate into uh, differences in access to resources and to education and right. to health care and so on, it wouldn't matter. Then we could talk about you know, people, uh, uh, cultural differences that way. But that's not the problem. The problem is, is that it harms people. Right. And we almost never talk to children about it harming people. And if we do, we talk about it as harming an individual. Right. And this, I think, is precisely the wrong way to use the children's uh, own skills and own uh, knowledge. Right. Well, what, it sounds to me like what you're saying is is the difference between looking at race as this very superficial thing that's about different practices and different celebrations, mm -hmm. as opposed to recognizing that for whatever reason, um, it goes a lot deeper than that. Um, go ahead. Well, um, race is not the only thing about which we uh, fail to notice children's uh, uh, deeper understanding. Uh, we often think that, uh, and then was a lead by many developmental psychologists too, that kids didn't actually understand what's called gender constancy. That is, that once somebody was a girl, they were always going to be a girl, and mm -hmm. once somebody was a boy, they were going to be boy, even if they were dressed up to look like a girl, and so on. <laughs> and uh, the same true uh, is is true about racial constancy. For a long time, it was believed that if you dressed up a little boy so that he looked like an Indian, that the, the you know, I'd say a Native American, that that the that other children would think he was actually Native American, and so right. on. Um, well, that turns out not to be true. Children think that uh, gender and race are very, very deep properties of people. I'm, and again, I'm talking about three, four-year-old kids. Right. So that when we tell them that that's not true, you know, that all of these differences are wonderful and we should celebrate them, but remember that they're really, everyone down deep is the same, we're telling them something that they deeply believe is not true. Mm -hmm. And it's unlikely to change their, their beliefs. I wonder if I could speak to one of the things that the caller brought up. Because sure. It, I think it's really important to understand that that the kind of situation that she was talking about, uh, and then Terrell was talking about as well, um, is not just a question of making someone feel awkward. Mm -hmm. These kinds of ways of, of um, highlighting race, even in the best of intentioned ways, Mm -hmm. can have enormously powerful and negative effects. There's work by a psychologist uh, named Claude Steele at Stanford yeah. that's uh, just uh, some of the most important work I've ever seen and should tell colleges a lot about how they should uh, um, interact and, and organize the lives of minority students. And, no, and although... They value him. They pay him lots of money. They try to get him to, to hire him at their own school. They don't change their, their own programs. Let me, let me give you the, the, the specific example. Yeah. Uh, Steele has shown that if you take a, a person and you, and you tell them, I'm going to give you a, a challenging test, and you give them a challenging test, they'll score, um, let's say they'll score 80. Okay. If the person's a minority and you tell them you're going to take a challenging test and you ask them to mark their their race just in, when they're filling in their name for the test they yeah. mark their race the same person's score will be lower that is once you tell them you remind them that people believe that members of minorities aren't going to do well at challenging intellectual tasks their own performance actually goes down Mm -hmm. Not because that they're less competent. Clearly, they're just as competent. It's not a question of, of their being unable to do it. It's that what he calls stereotype threat. It is in the air. And if you remind someone, even if they don't believe it, 
they know that other people believe it and it affects the way mm-hmm. they they perform which is a really amazing finding i mean the idea yeah. that just by asking somebody what their ethnic or racial uh, uh, group is should affect how they do on I mean just checking a box I mean right. not even going any further than that um, is just an amazing statement I want to well let me, let me just finish the, 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 I'm, I'm see I'm doom and gloom here <laughs> let's, okay well, let's look I don't know what Penn State does but if it's like other schools it will do something like this when um, uh, uh, minority uh, students are admitted yeah. sometime in the summer before they come they'll get a letter there were brochure explaining all of the various uh, uh, support services that the university makes available mm-hmm. so that they'll do well. Right. Now, they don't send that to the white kids. Right. right? And the, the minority students getting the letters know they don't send them to the white kids. Sure. So what are they doing? They are reminding every student that they're bringing in and they're hoping you're going to do well that they are unlikely to do well and are going to need special attention. Right. Well, this once again brings up the, how complex this is. We need to talk about it, but we can't talk about it in ways that make people then remember that that um, that by certain measures or by certain people's opinions, um, there is a problem here with with people of a different race. We are very close to out of time. Um, I'm, a, I'm very sorry to those people who are still in the queue. I I'm, I'm apologize for not getting to you. Uh, I'd like to thank uh, um, Terrell and, uh, and Larry and, uh, and get, us to, uh, get us to the end here, if I can possibly do that. There, that's the end part. Um, <laughs> Terrell Jones is Vice Provost for Educational Equity at Penn State. And Lawrence Hirschfeld is an associate professor of anthropology and psychology at the University of Michigan and author of Race in the Making. Race in the Making is published by MIT Press, in case you're interested in going out and looking for that. Um, I mentioned a couple of other books during the show that I wanted to re-mention, Loving Across the Color Line by Sharon Rush and The Freedom Writer's Diary by The Freedom Writers with Aaron Gruwell, G-R-U-W-E-L-L. Remember, please, that Race Matters is ongoing. We continue seeking community commentators and students interested in documenting their own experiences with race. If you'd like more information about those opportunities or just want to share an opinion, email us at racematters at psu.edu or call 814-865-9778. We'll be back Tuesday, June 11th, and we're going to talk about media at that time, which should be a really good uh, conversation. In the meantime, keep the dialogue going and log on to racematters.psu.edu, our work in progress on the web. Thanks for tuning in. Thanks again to both of my guests. Thank you. I'm Cindy Deutschman-Ruiz. Race Matters is made possible by support from the Office of Educational Equity at Penn State University. A copy of the program you've just seen can be purchased through Penn State Media Sales at mediasales.psu.edu or by calling 800-770-2111.